She is the co-founder of the fast-growing organization Goodler, and because of her vision for the youth, Galena is a member of the United Nations Initiative, the Compact for Young People in Humanitarian Actions. And she is a driving force behind this very summit. Uh, I personally got to meet her a couple times before, and she is just so inspirational. So I'm very happy to welcome Galina Fedorova. Good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for joining us at the first annual Social Impact Youth Summit. I'm very excited to be here, and I have a confession to make. Though before I do that, just to get us started and get you some, some interesting prizes, I'd like you to play this, this game with me. Uh oh So the game will be, um, I will show you a picture that shows something on that picture is missing. And you will be able to actually tell me, this is the first picture, and you can just, just out loud tell me what is missing on this picture. Wheels. Here we are. So Eric will give, throw out some of the t-shirts. Yeah, just go for it. Yeah, just get a few of them. Okay, our next picture. So what do you think is missing here? Ideas? Yeah, here we go. This is the picture. <laughs> And by the way, the t-shirts are all of a different sizes. So this is for you. If size is not yours and it's a women's, you can go around and find somebody during a lunch break that has a different size and you can just exchange. Yeah, keep on. Yep, Eric, hit me a little more. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, here we go. Yeah, some couple more. Thank you so much. Just stay there, uh, we'll, we'll have another chance, opportunity for you to do that, but just one extra question. So if you see a homeless person on the street, what does that person need? Money, food, shelter. Yeah, good, shelter is the right question, right answer, yes. But for some reason, a lot of people, when they see a homeless person, they actually uh, do think that this person's best, the most need is to, to eat. And uh, they bring them sandwiches and they bring them blankets and sometimes we even see people bring tents to homeless people. So that's why you see sometimes around San Francisco there are tents growing and growing and growing. And it's not the way to solve the issue. but. When I was nine years old, that's my confession, when I was nine years old, I was asked to volunteer at the after-school program. And my goal was to, to do homework with first graders. And I was so excited about that and I took this job very seriously. But after about one week, I got bored. I'm like, what else can I do with this group of first graders to, who are uh, ready to do whatever you tell them, they're looking in your eyes. And um, then I thought, oh, we have to do some kind of social project. And what that project would be, and um, the project would be, we're gonna clean houses for old people. And you might say, why? And first of all, old people, anybody over age of 30 or anybody who has a child at that point to me was old. So, but the logic went like that. So nine-year-old thinking, um, my mom would tell me, Oh, Galina, you need to go to see your grandma, and when you are there, make sure you help her to clean the house. You know she is old, she cannot clean the house, so please make sure you go there and do so. So the, the logic thinking that I had at that time would tell me, old people need somebody to clean their houses, they are unable to do so. Oh, wow, what if they don't have the grandchild? To help them, how do they do it? We must 
go and help them and save them from their dirty houses. So I got my group first graders together and um, the, uh, one, after one week, one day, I told them we're going to do something very special. We're going to go clean houses. What? Yeah, it's going to be fun. I promise you that. So we did our homework really fast. And for those who were slow, I did it for them. And, um, and then we sneaked out of the room, ran across the, uh, from the street, and started going door to door, knocking and at every door, at every house. Mind you that my school was in a pretty affluent area. So there were only stay-at-home moms around and well-to-do retired people. So the response was, what? You want to do what? Clean? Oh, no, 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 thank you. Have you had your lunch? No, we didn't. Okay, here's uh, some food and candies. So my first graders were really happy because at every house we would knock, they will get some candies. But I wasn't satisfied. My job was to find the cows to clean. And uh, so one, I, I said, you know, I have to use my sales skills. And I was able to convince this one lady who opened the door to let us do something. So she actually allowed me allowed my group to wash dishes. And there were only a few dishes in the sink, but she started talking to us. And I didn't know that she actually made a phone call to school because her son was studying in that school. I have this group of people here who are cleaning my dishes. What? Yeah, they're cleaning dishes. Who are they? We have no clue. Hold them and bring them back to school. Okay. And so the next thing, can we do something for you? No, let's go all together and we go back to school. And as we cross the street, I see the principal standing right there and looking at me. And of course I got reprimanded. So that's my story. But the confession is that I, over the years I did learn uh, to identify needs. I did learn how to partner with other people to solve the problems, how to collaborate with other organizations. But not until a few years ago when I, start, when I started thinking, what is the root cause to the problems I'm trying to solve? And why this particular person or this particular community in the situation they're in? Just a few years ago, I actually started to dig deep. And if you think it's just me, no. There are a lot of organizations right now fail because they, they did not dig deep enough to find out what the root causes is. Like, for example, if you think somebody tells you there is a, a lack of access to quality education in Africa, I know many of you would say, you know, let's do fundraising, let's get laptops and send them to Africa. And you know what? I'm even going to go further than that. I'm just going to Skype through them and I'm going to teach them English. I'm sure, you know, half of the audience here would have thought of that idea without really considering economic and cultural difficulties that Iran was talking about, about these, these girls. So, and this is just one example. Another example will be... Uh, there is no access to water. So everybody's like, okay, let's do fundraising and build a well. And what happens, you, you are so excited, you get the money, you send the money, the well is built, and then one month later, it breaks. But you are not there to help, and nobody there to fix. And there are no parts, even if somebody could have fixed it. And the well stands there as a structure. And also, it could be uh, those laptops are now stored somewhere in a storage area at the school because, you know, the, your, you, your life changed and you are no longer able to help to Skype and teach the, the language. And people that you got together to help you are no longer there. They got into college and they have different lives now. So this is happening over and over and over again. So what is the, the way to do it. I would like to introduce you to a term called smart philanthropy. And it's pretty much what it all about is to dig deep, to find root causes, 
and only then come with solutions that you think will be able to solve the issue. Number one thing though, before you even get there, you, before you start digging deep, I want to, and Ira mentioned that about vision and she talked about passion, but this is very, very important and might, it might be a cliche. You probably hear about follow your passion from everybody. You're, you are almost said read newspapers. Um, you you read your blogs or read your, you know, whatever news you, media you use. And um, there is something in your heart that just clicks. You know, certain news just uh, become more vivid than others. You know, some of you are, might be interested in... Um, um, human rights. Some of you love animals and cr look, animal cruelty is what touches you. Some of you would like to, help, to adopt every orphan in the world. So following your passion is essential. However, I do understand that when you're actually down on the ground and dealing with your daily things, that no matter how much your parents telling you follow your passion, when it gets to it, they're saying, this is what you're supposed to be doing. And when you actually don't follow your passion, what happens is you, it's becoming about you versus a person that you're trying to help. Why it's not good? Because at certain point, if it's because of you, you will be looking for some kind of gratification, either from a person who helps you or people from around you. And if you don't get that, if you don't get that, wow, job great done, you, your interest just disappears. And you are no longer interested in helping that person. You think they're ungrateful, they don't appreciate, and whatever else excuses you can find and you stop doing that. And when you follow your passion, then it doesn't really matter what that particular person thinks because you can see the big vision, you can see the big mission behind your actions. So this is uh, number one thing. And uh, if you don't have a passion, um, you have to do some self-reflection. Self it does not need to be some meditation session. It, it can happen just reading news every day that you, I'm sure you do. Just reflect on your reactions what news touched you the most. And Eric, some more, let's do this game. Um, who can, you, know, you all have mics, so if you can raise your hand and tell me about your passion and what you are doing, I think you need to press something, but raise your hand first because once you do, who has, who has the mic? Okay, go ahead. Oh, yeah, speak loud. and acting. Awesome. Who else? Oof. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> Who else has a passion? Yeah, go ahead. Can I yeah. Uh, my passion is women empowerment and breast cancer awareness. Yes, awesome. Breast cancer awareness and women empowerment. Awesome. Who else? Okay, in the back, lady in black. Yeah. Awesome, yes. Anybody else? Here we go, in front. Yes, perfect. So, yeah. And here you just throw a couple more for those that we didn't get to. Yes, and by the way, for those who wanted to speak, there is a little button right in the middle uh, at, the, at the lower part. If you press that, it will actually, the mic will be on and only one mic can be on at the time, so for the future. Yeah, thank you, Eric, so much. But the next step would be, <laughs> just to get one more in. No, no, just wait, yeah, we'll have, at the end, we'll do some more. So the second step would be is to identify the root cause of the problem. And so how to do that? Once you figure out what your passion is, yeah, I'm sure all of you know how to do research. You can just Google it. And, uh, but what to Google? Uh, I would like you to be able to find who 
around you is working on the same solution. There is no need for you to run and start a new nonprofit organization. And that's many people, that's what they do. But guess what? There are 25,000 nonprofits registered in California alone. And more than that, 9,725 of them are in Silicon Valley. And the biggest thing when you have a nonprofit, what do you do as the nonprofit founder? You raise money. So all these 25,000 nonprofits are trying really hard, fighting for your money. And there is no reason that you, you should go and start a new nonprofit. Find out of those, all nonprofits available to you, find those who are actually working on the problem you are trying to solve. And by digging deep, you can actually get a lot of inside information by once you get involved. And once you get involved, you can get involved as a volunteer. Later, you can get involved as a board member. You can just go and serve, go help somehow, some way. Just make sure that you are consistent. One time visiting and one time volunteering will not help you to find your solution that you're trying to, to, trying to find. And uh, the, that's where the next step comes, create solution. And once you did your research, you found an organization that is actually solving the issue, you looked at everything and you are like, wow, they are not doing it right. I think I can improve on that solution. Or you would think, wow, I can come up with a totally different solution. And by the way, don't, th out, uh, don't be afraid to think outside of the box because everybody tries to put you in and say your idea is not valid. But, um, and tomorrow you actually will learn during the hackathon, those, those of you who par will participate, you'll find th there will be a big part about how to start new ideas, how do, to start this process of creating a new idea. So those of you who will be uh, here tomorrow for the hackathon will get to learn that. And, but once you have that idea, make sure it is sustainable and make sure your idea is able to fund itself. So you know how you're gonna make money by creating that solution because we already said that there is 25,000 nonprofits fighting for fundraising money. So make sure that your idea can actually make money while making solution. And if you are, if you are thinking this is impossible to create a solution and actually it can be sustainable and profitable, then you're wrong. And you think everybody who, every person that will be coming after me during all day today will be actually people representing different companies. And those companies have created solutions that yes, and they are very profitable, that those solutions are moving this world forward. And some of them are moving it forward really, really fast. And uh, so listen to the, the speakers that come after me and you will see, um, you will get ideas on how to get there. And uh, so there are $365 billion donated every year in, um, uh, for nonprofit organizations. And a lot of that money, of course, is wasted. And uh, in order, uh, for a lot of people, they don't like to donate money anymore just because they don't think it's, it's created in you know, doing a good job of using the organizations are not doing a good job uh, using the money. So a lot of you prefer to donate goods. And, but you, many of you create a problem. So how many of you ever heard of a wish list? You know, anybody created a wish list for your birthdays, for bridal showers, baby showers, and things like that? Yeah, yeah, many of you know what it is. So organize, you know, everybody, if you're having a baby, you better make sure that all of the people give you a gift that you want. You know, you, are, you guys have a birthday, you want specific gift that you want. But civic and charitable organizations are addressing specific needs, don't have that ability, don't have that technology to create, that, to create the specific wish list. 
And that's where Goodler comes in. And Goodler, which is uh, Goodler Foundation is sponsoring this uh, event. Goodler is a technology that allows civic and charitable organizations to um, collect and manage in-kind donations. And why we're different? We are different because we are utilizing local resources in the areas of humanitarian action. You know, and it doesn't even have to be uh, resources in, uh, you know, let's say in the area where the wars are at. For example, did you know that one of the shelters in, uh, uh, after North Cal fires got 50,000 toothbrushes while they were hosting 300 victims. I had got a phone call just two days ago, it was very appropriate to say, I got a phone call from a school in one of the California uh, locations and they had a fire two years ago. They have a warehouse, they're still trying to unload the goods that we received after that fire. And they asked me if I know any of organizations who would take those goods. I had a people calling us and telling I have pots and pans. I had a jackets, but those are not the things that nonprofit organizations asking for. And for you, by out of your good hearts, you know, nobody questions that you sending goods different places, you 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 don't even know, but sometimes you're creating second tier disaster where those organizations don't know what to do with these goods. They have no ability to store them. And um, please stay uh, to see presentation from Miguel Jaller, who is actually a, a pr professor at UC Davis, and he does a lot of research on unsolicited donations, and you'll be surprised. So what Goodler does, it goes a different way. Instead of telling you, we don't need your goods, don't send us toothbrushes, we're, tell we're giving tools to nonprofits to tell you what they need. And you can go online and actually purchase those specific goods instead of you running to the store, grabbing toothbrush and bringing it over. And more than that, what we do is we, in areas outside of the United States, we use local retailers. So nothing needs to be shipped over to, from the United States, adding all these costs and then paying for um, unloading those shipments. And a lot of times they don't get unloaded till a few years later because 70% of goods donations that you donate are low priority or non-priority. So they just stay in the ports and a lot of them obviously cannot be used after even a few months at the port. So that's what Goodler does. And it, uh, you will also hear today from one of the panelists uh, Eric Robertson, who, is, uh, who found a way to use a uh, Goodler platform for his enterprise, where he used uh, goods from uh, social enterprises, from youth, who is actually creating certain goods, and they were selling those goods on a Goodler platform. Uh, and anytime you would buy, let's say, a $2 soap, to help after school program, you actually buying a soap that was um, produced by youth in, un, in uh, poorest areas of Chicago. So you're not only buying a soap and helping that after school program, you're actually also helping this youth to stay out of trouble. And he can tell you more about that later today. And uh, we had a very successful campaign in port with Puerto Rico recently, but one of the examples I wanted to bring, and those of you who will stay for the movie will actually get a chance to, um, to, see, to see exactly what I'm talking about, but after an earthquake in Nepal, Nepalese retailers were very scared. Those retailers that sell rice were going out of business because they got a lot of rice shipped from other countries into the countries to help. And they were going out of business as well as uh, producers of the rice were going out of business. So with what Goodler partnered with a few uh, local retailers and people in the United States and other countries were able to buy $20 bag of rice from local retailer that was delivered to victims. 
And uh, they were really, really happy because they knew if that doesn't happen right now, they will be out of business. And uh, we, uh, we helped them to stay in business and that's, the, that's our model. And with that, I would like to finish my presentation and thank you so much for listening to me and I hope you have a wonderful day today and uh, tomorrow you will learn a lot more. Thank you.